Well, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Charles Bradley. I work at ADAPT, a uh, tech policy and human rights consultancy based in London. Um, very excited to be here um, on the, the last day of this um, IGF. Um, we're in a very large room, and we would encourage people who are here um, to come to the table um, as we'll try and um, ensure we have a good conversation um, um, in a bit. And the more we can see your lovely faces, the more we can engage with you, and the more interesting uh, this is going to be. Um, I think this is my ninth IGF. Um, it's been a fun one. Um, uh, and there have been a inordinate number of discussions about um, AI, and this is another one. Um, we have a great panel um, uh, with uh, lots of experience and a range of expertise um, on, on, the, on the topic that we're going to talk about. Um, and I'm going to try and make this um, as um, sort of focused um, and as practical as possible. There have been lots of conversations floating at all different levels of feet, um, and we really want to make sure that we leave this um, having learned something or having something that we believe being challenged. So that's our sort of task today. So we actually leave the room with something new um, or thinking about something that we haven't thought about um, in the same way before. The session is uh, titled Leveraging AI to Support Gender Inclusivity. Um, and there are obviously many, many routes that this could um, take. Um, we really want to focus the session on leveraging AI as a tool for good. So how can AI actually be used to solve um, some of these problems. We're going to sort of kick off um, uh, as nearly every session at the IGF does with a round of sort of presentations and opening remarks from the panel. Um, rather than me go through uh, a very long introduction of their names, organizations, which you will, you will immediately forget, um, I will ask them uh, to introduce themselves as they speak. Um, um, and, and then we have plenty of time um, uh, uh, today uh, for a discussion, both across the panelists um, and within the room. Um, so I'd like us to leave the room knowing something new um, or having an existing sort of belief or, um, uh, or something sort of being, being challenged. Um, the other challenge I pose to you, which is unique, is that we actually engage with what people are saying in the room. So we'd like... Um, um, uh, our speakers to think about what the other speakers have said and try to connect their work to their, their peers um, and also for, our, um, uh, for when we're asking questions to really engage with what's already, already been said. Um, I think that will really help us try and get to, um, to, to, to something interesting for today. So with that, I will pass to our first um, speakers, uh, Christian and Emma from Google, who are joining us virtually. Um, Christian and Emma, over to you. Hi there, Charles. Can you see and hear me OK? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Um, thanks all so much for having us. My name is Emma Hyam, and I'm here from Google where I work with the Safe Search Engineering team as a product manager. I'm here with my colleague, Christian Von Essen, um, who's a lead engineer on the team. And we want to talk about one of the ways that Google is using AI to make search safer, but also more inclusive. Um, this sometimes poses unique challenges, which we can dive into in a second. Um, but in general, we're really excited about the technology and the way that it is actually enabling us to test our systems and provide a more inclusive system, a, a more inclusive experience in a way that we can validate and return back to users. Now, um, Christian, I'll pass to you to introduce yourself and then we can kick off with a few slides. I'll just get them up. Sure, but you did a good job introducing me already, I think. Um, so, hi, my name is Christian. Uh, I work for Google as a tech lead and a manager. I've been doing this for close to 10 years now and the kind of work that we're going to present here is has been one of the biggest breakthroughs that we had in the last yeah 10 years that I've been doing this. Awesome. Um, well, if you don't mind, guys, we'll just spend a few minutes sharing a few slides because I think this will make it more tangible and then we're looking forward to the discussion. So um, I'll start by saying 
that you know everything we do at Google goes back to our mission, organizing the world's mission, uh, organizing the world's information to make it universally accessible and useful. Um, and one of the things about the world's information is it's a lot of information, and uh, the information needs that we see are also um, at a huge scale. And they're dynamic. People come to us with new kinds of questions every day. In fact, 15% of all searches are new daily. That means that we need systems that are also dynamic. With hundreds of billions of web pages, 15% of queries are new every day. The question that Christian and I really ask ourselves in our job is how can we do content moderation? How can we offer safe systems which we design to be inclusive? And how can we do it at scale? We want to do that while still returning useful search results, ones that answer your questions. Um, so this is a dynamic challenge. And what we find is with these kind of scaled dynamic problems, pattern matching is really helpful. And one thing that I found as I've deep dived on AI is AI is really pattern matching at scale. It's using computers to do pattern matching in a way that we perhaps weren't able to do before not only to understand patterns that you know, help us do math, but also um, that help us understand sometimes inclusion problems. So um, I'll start by just kind of one of the fundamental principles that guide our work here. Uh, and then I'm gonna to pass to Christian to share some of the tangible ways um, that we have tried to improve on this approach. The first thing I'll share is that one of our principles in search is that we never want to shock or offend people with explicit or graphic content when that's not what they're looking for. You know, this is part of the fundamental thing of helping you find quality and relevant information. And people often ask us, well, how do your algorithms work? Like, how should we understand what you think of as quality? And something that kind of, I was really impressed by as I started working with the search teams is they actually publish a <laughs> um, hundred and I think it's 160 pages now um, of guidelines to raters that we use to help us understand the quality of results. And it's in these guidelines that you see this principle codified. The principle that we never want to shock or offend you with explicit or graphic content when it's not what you're looking for. And the way we do that is really by understanding um, the intent behind your query. Um, and understanding the intent behind your query requires language understanding. Now in the most sort of brute force way, <laughs> this would be you type in a query, I'm sitting here in um, Mountain View, California, you type in a, a query Mountain View, and we understand that Mountain View doesn't actually just mean a view from the top of a mountain, it um, means a place, because we have an understanding that Mountain View refers uh, to a place. And we know that because it matches a bunch of web documents about the place. Um, what we're seeing with natural language processing is that this is getting a lot smarter. Our ability to do pattern matching goes far beyond just understanding that Mountain View is a place. Um, and that's making us much more effective at understanding when you were seeking out something that may have been a little racy versus when you had more innocent um, interpretation of the query. But many of you may be wondering, why was there ever a problem with encountering uh, the shocking racy content in the first place? So I'm going to hand over to Christian to shed a bit more light on that. Thank you. So in particular in the past, but still nowadays to a large extent, at their core search algorithms like what Google is, really work by finding documents that have the same words that appear in your query, right? And so uh, these results really are a reflection of what the internet has to offer for these particular words. And for a query, say, like amateur, uh, the vast majority of these documents on the internet is pornographic, right? Amateur porn is a very popular thing. Um, but amateur doesn't really necessarily have porn intent, right? The user might be looking for something else and might be very surprised to be confronted with pornography. To, counter, to counteract this effect, uh, we have that, that requires special subsystems. And these subsystems always had also to focus on uh, queries that touch on identity terms, right? So that they are not unevenly uh, affected by um, shocking content. Can we move to the next slide? Thank you. Um, 
In 2022, we shared that we reduced uh, unnecessary se sexual results by 30% in the previous year. And we used AI language understanding, natural language understanding, to achieve this huge reduction. And we've seen a similar improvement in the following year. And we're still working on reducing the bad content further. Now, how can we use AI language understanding like BERT to do so? Let's go to the next slide. You might say that is as simple as just train a classifier to predict when sexual content is okay. Right? Uh, yeah, but as we all here know, that's why we're here, AI comes with its own challenges. In particular, an AI can suffer from uh, biases that would limit the usefulness. Right? If AI thinks amateur is, means porn, then it, it doesn't help us. So how do we address the bias in AI? Can we move to the next slide? Thank you. We specifically include training data, in this case, for protected minority groups. So for, for example, girls like Caucasian girls, Asian girls, Irish girls. And as you can see here, many patterns that we see as problematic are the same across groups. Black girl videos, white girl videos, something like that. And then when generating this training data for protected minority groups, we make use of these patterns to expand from one group to another automatically. And we can explore, exploit the same kind of patterns, not only to um, address issues in biases of AI, but also in the biases of human raters that generate this training data. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Now, we have this wonderful approach, but does it actually work? To know that we, we need to measure. Um, to measure if they actually are successful in mitigating the biases, we see where how our classifiers do uh, as we compare it across different slices. So are we, for example, as good or as bad as in a random other slice or in the whole slice uh, when we look at just queries touching on LGBTQ? or touching on gender, touching on race. So a bit more formal, the probability of predicting this virtual porn should be the same for any slice of data, no matter what the slice is, given the same label. So given that it actually looks for porn, but doesn't. And compared to the baseline models that we had earlier or that we have without this corrective training data, we do see significant gains in um, in equity, in, in showing the, in being the same quality for in, in slices and out slices. And then as we added more methods and more data, we saw even further gains. And that's this part and then back to Emma. Yeah, so I think, I think this is really exciting to me because I think we often um, worry about is a system working fairly for all user groups? Is the system working fairly and really representing the world um, in the way that you know it is fair to all user groups? What we've found here is that there's a way to actually test that. And does that mean that every single system um, when first naively built is going to be fair? No, because it's going to reflect biases and training data because it's going to reflect um, the biases of people that um, may make it. That's kind of true of any institution or, or system that we build. But we have a way to hold our systems accountable. And what I've been really excited about with AI is both the power of the natural language processing that we're seeing, the ability to understand users at scale across a wide range of locales and understand the nuances of what they're saying, while also holding that system accountable to making sure that it's working fairly across all of these different groups. And I wanted to share that because what we're also seeing is that similar to BERT, which is one form of natural language processing, we are also able to apply MUM, another um, very powerful system, to making our search um, results safer. One uh, critical example that's really close to my heart is how we've applied MUM to improve personal crisis searches. We see queries like how to get help in search. Queries, unfortunately, like I want to kill myself. These are queries which show the severity of a moment that a user is in, 
And they are not always written in naive terms. They're not always written in a way that is easy for us to understand. But with natural language processing, we're able to translate the queries and say, this looks like a user may be in a moment of crisis, which makes us more able to return relevant results and return helpful resources. And you know, for some of the severe queries I just mentioned, we really focus on partnering with NGOs around the world to provide helpful resources. The thing that we're particularly excited about with MUM is that we're able to be really effective across languages. There's 75 locales where MUM is trained and operating highly effectively, and that was the kind of power we were able to bring to the problem of personal crisis searches, leading to major improvements last year. That's all we have to share today. Um, we're really excited to talk more about AI and how we've seen it work, not just work, uh, not just um, be effective to the problem of being more inclusive across genders, but also to making systems safer at scale. Thank you, Emma and Christian. Um, so useful to set us up um, with that. Um, we needed to learn something new from today. Um, I've got Bert, Mum, pattern matching, slices, lots of things that I have questions about, um, and I'm sure people want to dig into, which we'll get into um, in a bit, but that's really, really sort of set the scene in very practical ways um, that um, uh, this technology um, or technologies can be used uh, to, for, for gender inclusivity. Um, we're gonna to come to uh, Babina next from uh, Policy. Um, so Babina, please um, you know, introduce yourself and, um, and the floor is yours, thank you. Um, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, thanks. Yeah, perfect. Morning. Uh, it's morning where I am. Uh, I understand it's afternoon over there. Um, it's a pleasure to be a part of this uh, discussion. My name is Bobina Zopa, and I'm a data digital rights researcher with Policy. So Policy is a feminist collective of um, researchers, uh, academics, uh, designers, etc. We work at the intersection of data, tech, and society. So a lot of our work um, is social technical in a sense. So we are uh, Pan-African. And so a lot of our work uh, just looks at how technologies are being adopted across the continent and how that is impacting communities in just um, different ways for the better or for worse. And we do that, especially through our research. We document that and come up with recommendations, particularly for government, but also now for um, other groups, civil society, and technologists as well. Um, I took this session over from Mima, who is our outbrain ED. Uh, she was unable to be part of this, but it's a pleasure to just be able to jump in and take this one. I just, um, you did, you know, talk about tying in with the, the previous speakers. And it's interesting because I, I was thinking around, um, I, I guess I'll jump into that in a bit. But I just did want to say that from the work we've been doing, we have a three-part uh, report uh, called Women in AI. So we've been looking at the intersection of um, uh, gender and AI for the past maybe three years. And we've documented that and just looked at how um, these technologies are being uh, used by African women who are in many ways, uh, you know, much less involved in terms of um, access, in terms of, um, you know, usage, uh, meaningful um, usage where you know, there are limitations in terms of language, in terms of literacy, et cetera, et cetera. But um, just recently, actually yesterday, we have a new handbook that just published. We've been doing the work with IDRC and this is um, sort of putting across um, draft principles to guide uh, policymakers in thinking about how to govern these systems, but not just policymakers, civil society and technologists as well as they're developing these systems. Um, so just of the background, I think for my sharing today, I just wanted to point out that a lot of our work has been in a sense critical because uh, we're feminists and so we use the Afro-feminist lens to um, you know, analyze uh, this intersection that I've been talking about. And I'll just start from um, a point of, I think something that for us we've been, especially with the, uh, the last piece of work, the handbook that I've been talking about is um, we've been broadly questioning the the notion of as technologies are being developed and um, adopted across the continent. I, I'm, I'm, I'm rooting this very much within our work, which is on the African continent, but I am open to open this up. Is um, 
is, is that the notion of benefit, right? Um, that these technologies are benefiting people in such and such a way. I think that's a very broad term and our work has been working to, um, you know, sort of demystify that or just make that very clear. What does benefit mean for different communities as um, maybe a model is being, uh, there is satellite models we're seeing that are being brought about to just, uh maybe uh, uh look at how how much communities are getting electrified what does that do for the communities uh, as they are maybe getting um you know more surveilled and they're losing their privacy so we've just been working to understand that notion of benefit what does benefit mean indeed and so from that we've been moving to a point of you know i think uh we did uh, we've seen that a lot of the research that's being done around you know understanding uh, ethics and responsibility when it comes to development and adoption of ai is the notion of safety and security but i think we're trying to move more to a place of um, emancipatory and liberatory ai how do these technologies bring just more agency more freedom more non-discrimination more equality for uh, the people who these technologies are being you know created for or as governments are bringing them down to the people for you know public benefit or private sector using them for what for whatever reasons and so um i'll just say then that you know uh, a number of things I, i'll just again i think maybe quickly tie in with what emma and uh, christian was, was sharing which was um something that i think i wanted to talk about a little very interesting to hear about for example the mom um model and the crisis, uh, you know, such as that's really, really interesting to hear about. When you're talking about the, you know, uh, trying to shelter the users from the, um, say, explicit or graphic information, that's something I think first we've been exploring on the other end, under uh, just the, 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 uh, the, 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 the broader trying to bring to question how does that happen as you're trying to clean up those data sets so visibilizing of the workers who are behind uh, doing that work so i've been very interested in hearing that from both both of you emma and christian because we've been talking so much about that you know in the broader you know data just data justice and data exploitation conversation because we do know that these models well are you know of course advancing greatly and are able to in you know many ways uh, do sort of self cleaning but there is again you know human labor that is doing that that cleaning and so what does that mean for the, the people that are doing that work is it is, is what are the you know what's their quality of, of life from doing that work so the, that's that's one of the things with i i, I just want to quickly tie that in with that with the you know bias and just trying to de bias the systems and then um just broadly i think we've been looking at as our societies are increasingly data buying and so part of that is you know intelligent systems are being taken up in different you know parts of our societies um we've been looking at for example femtech which is i think something that's becoming popularly especially here on the continent where for example women haven't typically had easy access to medical services and now there are these um you know this, these are femtech apps that you could use, whether they're men menstrual health apps or pregnancy apps. And now we've uh, read work, for example, I think Mozilla has done a lot of work on this, uh, showing that, you know, there is uh, the consent, um, um, the consent regimes are are faulty or then they're not very meaningful in the sense that um, the, the 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 terms and conditions that are offered in there are sometimes just the legalese is too much for the people to understand or they're, they're confusing or they do leave out certain notions where maybe your data will be shared with a third party. So these are just a number of issues that we're exploring in our work as well. Um, meaningful concept, etc. We're looking at also techno chauvinism as a lot of these um, technologies are being brought up. This is again from Meredith Brewster's work. We were looking at um, I, you know, again, going back from where I started, which is, you know, the notion of benefit. Sometimes technologies are brought onto communities and they do not do more good and they instead do more harm. And so we're questioning the notion of this, this notion of any and every technology is for the good. And so we moving away from the idea of techno solutionism and, you know, moving to a place of, you know, 
uh, getting solutions on board that actually are relevant to communities' needs and their realities, etc. Um, so I think for us in our broader conversation, we find that we engage a lot with the conversation of power symmetries. Again, there is the developer, there is the end user, and along that, especially for the end user, um, how do these technologies, you know, impact their lives for better, for worse? And we look at that, and we find that usually it's not unidimensional. Usually it's um, intersectional in a way. You know, you find if it is harm, it's happening at a very intersectional level at different levels um and so just to wrap up my uh, submission i just want to say for us we're very much interested in moving towards a place of um you know realizing um ai technologies that are more you know liberatory and emancipatory to to the communities that these technologies are being brought to thank you Thank you very much. Um, yeah, and really sort of helped paint a picture of the, the, the wide variety of ways that this technology um, can, you know, can be very beneficial um, and, and really improve on, on, on some of these values that we've been talking about. Um, Jim, I'm going to pass you. Testing. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, so, Charles, I just wanted to point out that we were supposed to have another academic present, uh, Dr. Luciana Bonatti from the uh, National University of Cordoba in Argentina. Uh, I guess being on the other side of the world, sometimes you miss news, but um, apparently there's an outbreak of wildfires in that part of Argentina, and she and her family had to evacuate. So, if she watches us down the road, we just want to let you know we're thinking of you, and we hope everything works out for you. And we look forward to working with you in the future. Thanks, Jim. We're going to go to um, Lucia at the OECD next. Over to you. Uh, hello, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the invitation and for uh, this very interesting panel. Um, my name is Lucia Rus. I'm from the OECD, the Artificial Intelligence unit and I will uh, talk a little bit about the OECD AI principles and, and <clears throat> the way they excuse me, um, they uh, promote uh, gender equality in AI. So just as a, um, to, a, a bit of a background, um, what are the OECD AI principles? The OECD AI principles were, um, are a set of principles, um, an intergovernmental standard uh, on artificial intelligence that were adopted in 2019 and were developed uh, through a multi-stakeholder process that we involved over uh, 50 experts um, with the objective of coming up uh, with principles uh, that would um, be a common uh, gui guideline for, uh, for countries and AI actors uh, in developing uh, trustworthy AI and, and to um, and steer uh, technology in, in an innovative way, but also in a responsible way. Um, these principles were also endorsed later on by uh, the G20, and so they, we are um, today over today. Forty-six countries have adhered to these principles. These are uh, principles that are not binding in nature, but still they represent a commitment uh, from countries that adhere to them uh, to steer technology uh, in a way that is um, embedding those principles. And they are um, ten. Uh, principles which are organized into five value-based principles and five recommendations to policymakers. So um, in terms of uh, the value-based, uh, these are, um, a pro they, they call for promoting AI, which is um, aim at inclusive growth, sustainable development and well-being uh, that embed human-centered values and fairness, AI that is transparent and explainable, safe, secure, and robust, and, it, and they call for uh, actors to be accountable uh, throughout the AI life cycle. And then the five recommendations to government concern uh, policy recommendations around investing in AI, uh, research and development, uh, fostering a digital ecosystem for AI, uh, shaping and enabling policy environment, uh, building human capacity and preparing for labor market transformation, and, and lastly, uh, to foster international cooperation for trustworthy AI. Now, all, uh, all these principles, in a way or another, um, touch, obviously, uh, uh, on gender equality, but in particular, uh, the first and the second uh, 
call on stakeholders uh, to proactively engage in responsible stewardship of trustworthy AI in pursuit of beneficial outcomes for people and the planet and in advancing inclusion of underrepresented population, uh, reducing economic, social, gender, and other inequalities. Uh, and then the second principle calls on AI actors to uh, respect the rule of law, human rights, and democratic values, and including non-discrimination and equality, diversity and fairness. So I would point to these two as perhaps the most relevant uh, in this conversation. Um, and, and then obviously uh, these are principles and then they, they state um, very high level um, uh, guidelines for countries. So what, uh, are, uh, what are, have we been doing and what our countries doing uh, to implement those principles. So since 2019, uh, we have been working at the OECD to help uh, countries implement in practical ways uh, these principles, and we have been monitoring through um, as, uh, an OECD AI, the OECD AI Policy Observatory uh, policies uh, that countries have been putting in place uh, to meet, to address all of these principles. So here, uh, obviously, uh, I won't be exhaustive. Uh, I, would, I wanted just to point to a few examples of policies that have been uh, 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 implemented in countries. For instance, um, in the United States, uh, when we talk about, uh, well, we know that to make uh, AI more inclusive uh, and also to, um, to reduce bias and, and, inclusive fair and in increase fairness, uh, one important aspect, and, and it was discussed uh, by, uh, by Google, is about data quality. Uh, and so in the United States, an example is um, the Artificial Intelligence Machine Learning Consortium to Advance Health Equity and Researcher Diversity uh, that basically is a, pro uh, it's a, pro a program that aims to make electronic health record data more representative so that training data is of higher quality, but also um, to increase the participation and representation of researchers from underrepresented communities in AI and machine learning uh, so that uh, basically algorithm bias uh, is ensured by uh, including data from different genders, ethnicities, and, and backgrounds, but also by a more diverse representation uh, in AI development. Uh, and again, and, and another example of uh, fostering inclusivity and equity in AI development is a program in the, U in the UK uh, promoted by Alan Turing Institute, uh, which is Women in AI uh, and, and Data Science. Um, and here there are three pillars to this program. First one, to map the participation of women in data science and AI uh, in, a, in the UK, but also globally, uh, with the ultimate objective of increasing women uh, participation in these fields. Uh, second, examine diversity and inclusion in online and physical workplace. And last, um, exploring how gender gap affects scientific knowledge and technology technological innovation um, by, and then promoting a gender inclusive uh, AI design. So these are two examples. And then last, uh, last two points I would make, uh, there are also other uh, uh, approaches taken by countries, for instance, uh, in the Netherlands and Finland, uh, there have been um, uh, attempts to um, uh, um, build guidelines and assessment frameworks for non-discriminatory AI systems that basically uh, help um, identify and manage risk of discrimination, especially in public sector AI systems. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and so these are guidelines for especially public servants when they uh, uh, use or, or procure uh, AI systems. Uh, and the last point is, uh, last year we launched a, a catalog of tools still on the same uh, platform, the OECD AI Policy Observatory, and this is really a uh, a, a platform that is intended to uh, share um, tools for trustworthy AI and and in deep, and basically institutions around the globe can submit uh, tools so that that other uh, organizations can use them in their work and and just having a quick check you can 
so it's a searchable database where you can search for objectives that these tools are uh, aimed at uh, achieving and for instance looking at uh, reducing bias and discrimination and, in, and, include, uh, and ensure fairness, uh, we have over 100, 100 tools. And for instance, one uh, that I was checking yesterday came up uh, is uh, uh, at Google, uh, the uh, people plus AI research multidisciplinary team that uh, explores the human side of AI. So this is one example. Uh, other example is, for instance, a tool which is called CounterGen, uh, which is a framework for auditing and reducing bias in NLP um, uh, and uh, basically it generates a, a counterfactual data sets um, uh, so comparing the output of a model between cases where um, uh, the input is a member of protected category where and two cases where it's not. So these are just examples one can search and um, browse uh, for more um, but uh, so I, I wanted to give a bit of a um, uh, of an overview of, of, of things that exist, but obviously this is all uh, illustrative and um, I look forward to uh, questions and, and discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucia. There's so much in what you said. Um, I'm sort of trying to scrabble around your website to find all, all the amazing resources that you share. So maybe we can pick back up some of those points because they also tie back into some of the key ones earlier around like data, like proving that we know what is happening, baselining and, and trying to improve outcomes. And it feels like that might be something that we sort of want to dig into a bit more um, as, as we get into this discussion. Um, but I'm going to pass to our um, last speaker, um, uh, Jenna. Thank you. Thank you for having me on this panel today. My name is Jenna Fung. I am the program coordinator of the Asia Pacific Youth Internet Governance Forum. As I share my thoughts, I will perhaps change my head a little bit. Um, but um, to start with, I probably will refer most of the outcomes from our regional output, as well as uh, some respond to all the information we just got. Uh, I came from a background that's totally not technical. I don't have research background either, and so this is a really fruitful sharing earlier to me, and I actually was assigned to give reactions. And so I was paying so much attention and, act, and it actually made me thought of a, a few points, but I will share it at the end of my speech because uh, I probably want to point out a few things that uh, the Asia Pacific youth actually talked about. So while most of the people, and I think we have had enough session at IGF that talks a lot um, how we concern about the impact and risk with AI and the implication of it. But maybe because with the youth, because of our lack of experience and expectation and the knowledge, we are quite positive. That's my, pr that's my observation by working uh, closely with the youth. But of course, with that group of youth, it's just Asia Pacific voice. Uh, I, we know that there's like majorities of the online populations are formed by young people, but we don't really get to invite all of them to our conference. So this is still just a representation of voice. But what we see is that when we erase those knowledge and baggage or things that adults would usually carry, the younger generations are quite positive. And the reality is we must implement these things to our everyday life, because I personally see it that way as well. And I think with the technology, especially after uh, Christians and Emma sharing, I really think that AI can eliminate human bias, which is something we unconsciously um, act out and we don't know. Um, and so I, 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 I am positive about that, just like, uh, just name some examples. I'm an Asian, and sometimes, just picking it up, we, we might use marginalized group or minority to describe certain groups of people. But with that, that means we unconsciously subscribe to certain ideas that what, that's why we have that kind of concept, right? But earlier with, with Lucia, um, use a different adjective to use, I think Lucia actually used underrepresented group instead, which is rather neutral. We did not intentionally do that, but we, we would have this kind of bias sometimes. And I do think 
technologies can help us with that. And of course, because we will have policy in place where we, uh, I believe everyone who are in this room will subscribe to the ideas of having a multi-stakeholder approach, my assumption, uh, to, um, to form these policies. And if those policies are in place, I believe we can proactively eliminate those kind of bias that we don't intentionally send out. Um, and so just charming, uh, just bringing in some ideas from the youth uh, forum that we had, it's, I think it's really important to get the users and consumer to uh, co-design all these policies, might not, mm, and, and also have, have like technical community to be involved in policy making as well, because uh, they have the knowledge about the technologies but not all of them, like currently, might be included in all levels of policy making. Um, and so if we have them participate more into uh, this process of making policy for like such complex technologies like AI, I think that will be really important as well. And, um, and I believe international Standards are really important because that's how country, different countries can modernize their legal framework and, and so that they can cater the needs of their own nations. And it will also help different um, in this, uh, in industry to follow and to handle their, uh, the, their space. Because for example, what I see is that big tag is running most of these service platform where I live on. I am a Gen Z. So these are privately owned public space, uh, which govern and regulated by private sector. Um, and I think international standards is really important because that will provide a comprehensive guideline for that, which is human centric, as another speaker mentioned. Um, and before I wrap up, I want to take this uh, opportunity to pr probably bring out just something really personal about hope that I, I, I'm not appear to being too rude. Uh, other than like um, my my usual work with the youth, I am a writer and I have like a Substack newsletter. Um, but I am like a really small scale writer, and so I don't really get the money to pay and get my own domain. And so my newsletter is actually not really. Uh, appearing on Google search result because of the policies between probably, well, I, I don't really have the knowledge, uh, but uh, I, I assume it's like the policy between Google and Substack, and I think there might be something to do with Substack. They change policy at some point, which my newsletter is not showing on Google anymore. Um, and so that's just one personal example that I want to throw at here because Google is one of the biggest search engines that adopt by most people in this world. And I, I just wonder if we are talking about inclusivity, how can we or how can enterprise uh, put a mechanism in place to um, ensure small scales writer, for example, in my case, to be included as well. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yes, really good points um, raised from the obviously the conversations you've been having with um, the youth community um, at your, the forum before, um, and a very specific question at the end that we might want to take um, offline um, to someone that might 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 know might know the answer to that one. Um, we're going to start getting people involved and, and and have a proper proper conversation. So, um, if there are are things to come along, please um, do put it in the chat if you're online or ra raise your hand. Um, I wanted to. First, come back to Emma and Christian, um, and then I'm definitely going to come to people who have good questions. Um, and uh, ask, there, there was a point from, uh, from um, Lucia who talked about um, the sort of counterfactual fairness um, at Google. Um, and I wanted to see whether um, Emma or Christian, you could share a bit more about your experience of, of that, if you can answer that. Yeah. yeah. Um I'm happy to talk about that. We've um, we've had a similar approach. When I, I had this slide with these, this is 
we see similar patterns, right? This, this replacement there is exactly the counter the counterfactual similarity that we are trying to get here. Um, this has been central and super useful to us. Um, what also is helpful is ablation of certain terms. Sorry, yes. Do, I was, was going to ask just. Could you give us a 10 second um, definition of what that means for people who might not know what counterfactual fairness means in that context? Yes, of course. Uh, so the idea is um, when you take a user's query, for example, and it has a marginalized a minority group in there, like, I don't know, black woman video, right? Then um, the likelihood that a classifier predict something about this person um, for this query should be the same when you, uh, for black woman video, for the counter, as for the counterfactual query, where you replace black woman video with black man video, or white woman video, or, you know, if you replace these terms, the output of the classifier should not change significantly. Um, the other part then is ablation. It shouldn't matter much whether you're talking about black woman video, black woman dress, or just woman dress, right? Um, that is also uh, essential to what we've been doing here. But if you do this counterfactual fairness, you're still sticking in a certain sense to a slice of the data, right? We are still sticking to gender terms, to race terms. Um, also outside of these slices, the uh, or, this particular slices, the behavior of these methods of these classifiers and systems should be the same. It doesn't matter if we're talking about genders or LGBTQ queries, right? Um, the quality of the classifiers between these slices needs to be the same as well. That's the, 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 the metric part that we had. So counterfactual is great, ablation is great, and then we, we go beyond that. But it's a fantastic first step to augment your training data to get the classifiers say the right things, things and be fair. And then, sorry, Emma. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I think a, a lot of this is about asking your system questions and seeing how it performs. And what you really want is to be able to ask the question of, you know, black women hairstyles, white women hairstyles, see are we getting results that we consider to be equivalent? See what happens if we type in the query hairstyles. Um, there will always be some disparity because these systems are operating at mass scale, but we aim to have a way to hold the system accountable and reduce any disparity that we see. Um, and I think I did hear a question um, earlier on, I think it was from Zulfa around data justice. You know, I think one thing that I've been impressed by here is that these systems are able to learn from patterns um, such that sometimes you can have a relatively small amount of data to start to interrogate the system. And you can see that a system is not behaving well with just a few examples. You don't have to um, find every um, potential item in, in, a, in a large set of potential identity groups in order to interrogate the system. You just need a few to say, is this system behaving wrong? Um, and, and that already helps. So this idea of small data being enough to interrogate the system has been very powerful. Are there any questions to, on this point particularly, so we can carry on this thought? Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much for all the sharing. It's really interesting. So I have a bit of a specific question. So it's on leveraging a, I mean, leveraging AI to um, for to reach you know goal of gender inclusivity. But to what extent um, is this corrections you're talking about that are happening after? So like in terms of fine tuning rather than beforehand, which is you know when you're feeding in the training data. Because I think there was a recent um, recently published article about a study from the University of Pittsburgh about how. Um, there is no clear data, no clear percentage of how much of the training data being used to train these LLM, how much of it is women authored data. And so it perpetuates the gender gap because, okay, when you're looking at the, the, the digital divide between Global North and Global South, then if you look closely at those online in the Global South, more likely they're going to be male, um, male users online. And then, so I just want thoughts on, um, you know, what, what do you feel about this particular problem that is it more fine tuning that's happening after you're finding these bias outputs or how much percentage of effort is going into looking at 
um, using more diverse training data. Thank you very much. I think that's for Google. Yeah. Um, so in the beginning, a few years ago, uh, when we started with BERT and the language models became bigger, um, and the first step was to create models that are credible and useful at all. It was more of a fine tuning step later, right, to address and correct these biases. But as we're getting more into even larger models where training data selection now becomes a more uh, challenging problem and where also these kinds of um, concerns have spread more through the community and get more scrutiny not only outside, but also con from communities inside Google, this uh, gets more and more into the um, first step of training. So before fine tuning is happening, correcting the first step of data and making sure that that is representative um, gets ever more into, um, yeah, into that first step as well. And fine tuning and first step also get ever more mixed and intermingled, right? So um, that the question as such becomes very tricky to answer where, where, where does the first step end and fine tuning that start as we're talking about mixtures of training. Yeah, I, I mean, I would just plus one. I, I think it, it, these things are increasingly very, very intermingled, but what you do see is what an amazing technology. Um, let's see what this technology can do. As we're applying this new technology, how could we design it in a safe way? How could we design it in a way that it's inclusive? You look at that first version of the technology and then the first thing you do before you think about bringing it to market is you interrogate it. You, you do the fine tuning based on, based on those tests. And then if it didn't work well, you go back to the first step again. So this, this is, it's really cyclical and there are many layers at which we can um, hold our systems accountable. Um, often you have, uh, you know, foundational models that you're using for lots of different use cases and you want to make sure those are working well, as well as specific use cases, seeing how it's behaving in context and making sure that in context is working well for users for a specific product experience. Um, great question. Yeah, very good. Whilst we're still on the point, um, Lucia, is there sort of advice, tools, resources on this particular point on the OECD that we should be looking at? Well, n not on, on this specific, no, we, we just, um, we are uh, more on analyzing the big trends. So just to mention that we have uh, two papers on generative AI, uh, one uh, that is really uh, analyzing some preliminary considerations around these aspects that have been discussed, uh, like um, uh, what what are these models, how they are evolving, what what kind of um, um, yeah policy implications they have around safety, for instance, and what kind of measures are developers uh, implementing. So this is one paper, and then uh, there is another paper that we did uh, to support this at G7 Hiroshima process around generative AI. And basically there, uh, there is an analysis of what uh, countries, based on a questionnaire to member G7 members on what countries feel uh, are the main risks uh, around uh, generative AI, but also the main opportunities. And so what kind of actions internationally can be undertaken. So this is more uh, in terms of, again, on, on, on policy responses. Uh, this, this is the contribution uh, from the OECD, but very much uh, I'm very much enjoying the conversation uh, to, to understand better uh, where where are the at which point uh, you can intervene, um, and this is very enlightening <laughs> for us as well. Great, yeah, absolutely. Um, and obviously, the the role that you're playing on the the bigger picture of this conversation, it's sort of critical to get into the real weeds uh, here because you know the devil is really really in the detail, isn't it? Um, we have a question online, and then. Yeah, thanks, Charles. Uh, so it's from Samriti Kumar. Uh, it's a bit of a comment and a question. I think I still remain a tad bit skeptical about how AI and gender inclusivity may interact, especially when AI may pre present itself as a popular tool for surveilling people 
based on gender. What are the possible solutions for this dilemma? Babina, what do you think? How, how, we could, how, is this, um, how, how could it be a solution to this dilemma? What are the solutions here? Um, I think it's a lot of things that uh, the panel is trying to you know, speak directly to here. But uh, I, I think um, I share the sentiment with the person who asked the question that I'm also very skeptical as to how realistic some of these things are or how feasible they are. So for example, um, the, uh, the persons from Google have been sharing how, you know, from the previous uh, question, you know, when the person asked about the training data sets as opposed to, you know, fine tuning and then, um, Emma, I think uh, you did share your optimism that you know we do have a good tool and we can um, before we send it out to the market, you know, get it in a you know a much better place before we send it out to the communities. But I think um, that in a sense, you know, again, is is the I, I mean I think for me and this may tie in with Lucia's work as well with some of the work we're doing on the regulatory arm of things is it comes in to balance out competing interests because there is Google, which is um, developing these technologies and there is a, a number of interests that they have, you know, from the information sharing to being a profit making company as well to the communities or the persons that these technologies are being pushed out to the end user um, who these technologies could pose real life impacts um, on. And so I think for me, it's just, um, I think we, we just need to be very intentional about thinking about these things from the get-go. And I think it's a lot of what we are re reiterating here, everyone else of us. Um, it could be with our OECD's principles, thinking about these things from the get-go as um, you know, we're getting into development, even from the ideation stage. And then I think then we think about how more uh, intersectionally factoring in these, 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 uh, these factors as opposed to you know, waiting to, oh, we push this out and then, oh, we, uh, we can now try to, uh, we're putting fires out in, in a sense. And so, for example, the data, um, the data issue, I, I'm very skeptical as well when you mentioned that, you know, small data sets, I do totally agree these uh, technologies have um, immensely evolved and they're able to use just small data sets to, to you know, just do so many uh, of, of these things you've been talking about, like, you know, looking out for bias, et cetera. But then again, that speaks to, again, someone mentioned this, if we do have limited data sets that are not representative of a big uh, part of maybe the, the, the global majority, how do we expect realistically that not to reflect in the, in the products that are pushed out at the end, at the end? And so I think it's, it's a, a lot of the caution or the, the skepticism has been expressed through a lot of you know scholars work over the last year too and i think a number of principles like the oecd is doing unesco etc the work we're doing and so many other organizations civil society etc are saying you know are factoring these things from the get-go and think about these things from the get-go and then that could counter the skepticism because then we're sure that we're pushing out products that are safe and are going to actually be of benefit to to the person that these products are being pushed out to Thank you. Yeah, we gave you the really hard question, so um, thank you for giving us such an eloquent answer to it. Um, we have another question in the room. Andrew. Thanks, and um, thanks Google for the opening presentation, which is kind of interesting to get a bit more into the weeds about how you actually are trying to manage these problems. And I guess my question is a bit about the value of, of, of non-binding principles. There are currently about over 40 international processes setting out how to govern AI. A couple are binding, European. There's a cluster of UN ones which may go nowhere, and there's 25 plus voluntary non-binding initiatives being developed by a variety of industry and other types of bodies. And I just query the value of endlessly producing high-level sets of principles which aren't, don't overlap or aren't consistent, but may all offer slightly different variations. And it strikes me what was interesting about the, um, the Google presentation is what would be of real value to the wider public would be something that I think doesn't yet exist, which is a mechanism to independently audit what you're doing to assess whether the steps you're taking at the engineering level are actually producing the outcomes 
that you want to be desirable. And if they do, you get some kind of kite mark or some recognition that what you're doing with AI is actually fulfilling those wider social goals. And it strikes me that that would be, given the time, money, and effort that goes into things like the IGF, which is a, a whole series of fairly non-binding conversations or these voluntary principles, whether investing some of that time and money in developing those independent audit mechanisms might be a more useful use of the planet's resources in terms of getting at what we want to get at. I think I'll let the OECD respond first, Lucia. Okay, well, uh, thank you. So I, uh, I, I've i never done an analysis of all of the principles that exist, so I don't know to which extent it's fair to say that they are don't overlap because I would assume that there is a large uh, overlapping among these principles. And, and for instance, if one takes... Um, uh, US, well, recently the UK came up with um, their innovation, their, their, their approach to, to AI uh, regulation, and that is based on, um, again, high-level principles, cross-sectoral principles, and they do overlap to a large extent, or even like almost all of the principles overlap with the OECDI principles. The same, um, uh, I, I don't know, the NIST management framework in the US, it's, it's, it's really closely uh, linked to the work of the OECD. Uh, we did a classification framework for AI systems, but basically uh, what, what it says is that not all AI systems uh, are equal. They don't have the same uh, risks. Uh, they don't have the same impact uh, on the different context they, uh, they work in. So there needs to be this risk-based approach, which is something that is becoming, uh, that is becoming the approach taken in most jurisdictions. Even the UAI Act takes a risk-based approach by classifying risks um, uh, of AI systems and having uh, provisions related to, uh, to, to the different systems systems uh, based on the risk category they fall in. So I, I'm just saying I, I understand the concern of having a plethora of, of principles. Uh, I don't think there is a hierarchy of principles, but yet there are, I think, some principles that uh, are, uh, are like m more... Um, that are being implemented in a, in a more uh, uh, uniformly uh, across countries and with some variation, of course. And I, I would, uh, I have not done this exercise, but perhaps uh, uh, try and check uh, what, uh, where they overlap, because I'm sure there is a lot that has to do, again, with fairness, with transparency and explainability, with accountability and safety, security. So I, I, I understand and I, I, I think uh, it's a fair concern to say that uh, everyone is doing its own principles. Um, perhaps there, there is also, I mean, this is also a very new field. <laughs> Everything is in the making, so even regulation is uh, experimenting really and, and trying to understand what's the best approach. So um, I, I, I would say, um, yeah, perhaps there needs to be some more alignment uh, and there are attempts lately to have more international coordination. Uh, as I was saying, the G7 is one. Um, the UK is promoting this uh, safety summit uh, at the beginning of November. The UN is also advancing work. Um, so I think there is, uh, th there are, there are uh, activities to, um, to come together and have uh, more coordination on that. Uh, and I think uh, the, the mechanism of uh, auditing the systems that um, I, 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 I agree there is not such a thing uh, yet. Uh, there's, when, when it comes, well, certainly with standards and with the UI Act, there will be uh, a check on, on the systems. So, I, it won't be uh, perhaps the same thing that it was proposed, but I think there is a lot that is in the making. So uh, all of this is is just like being developed right now. So I I, I don't have an, an answer, a full answer. I'm sorry, it's a very difficult question. Uh, but I just want to say that uh, there is a, also a, there are a lot of discussions and there is a lot of commonalities. This, 
despite the fact that there seems to be a lot of, <laughs> of uh, uh, lack of convergence uh, and uh, um, uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and I think that sort of the the principles have started to uh, sort of um, the principles work that's been going on for a while now has started to sort of uh, give us the the, the 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 train tracks for the regulation that it, that is coming, and that has a lot more a lot obviously a lot more teeth um, to it, um, 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 and that might sort of get to some of the points that Andrew was um, Andrew was raising. Um, does anyone else want to come on this point before I ask another question from the panel? No. I suppose it, w w one of the things it comes, uh, and, and uh, any more questions in the room whilst before? One of the things um, uh, this sort of gets to is trust in measurement. Like Google have, you know, and, and Emma and Christian have given us this great presentation around what you're already doing to, to measure bias and reduce um, sort of uh, certain biases in that, uh, in, in your work, and also how you've been able to reduce um, shocking and offensive, you know, content um, uh, through th through some of the technologies that you've used, um, but we've also heard the sort of the, the 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 flip of that, which is sort of you know Google marking its own sort of homework and showing that um, uh, you know how you're measuring against your own known biases and how you're improving your own system against your own sort of um, so some measurements. So I think it's sort of. Some of this is really about how do we build trust in the um, uh, in 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 that measurement and in that system, and I wonder whether any of the panelists had some thoughts on that. So, if we're going to use AI, um, and we we you know, and we we believe in the potential of AI to um, uh, to increase gender inclusivity, how do we know that it's actually doing that, and do we trust trust that, and how how might we trust that more? Any sort of reflections or thoughts on that from the panel? Or anyone in the room? Well, can I just repeat my plea for an independent audit process? I mean, the only way you know is if you don't trust the company to mark its own homework, someone else, someone else has to mark the homework. And yeah. uh, I think my point is, going back to the OECD, it's not, I'm not saying there are, I think there is agreement, fairness, inclusivity, there's a set of things we already know we want AI to do and need to do. What we don't have is any method of assessing whether any of the applications are actually doing it. And that's where I'm saying time and investment needs to go within the wider community rather than in doing yet more sets of principles. So, so I think the independent audit is the key thing. And you know, I, I have no reason to distrust what Google are doing. You know, on the basis of what I've heard today, it sounds perfectly credible, perfectly sensible, and they're trying to work with the limitations of data, et cetera. But obviously, for the, wider, for the rest of the wider public, it needs to be audited in some way to satisfy us that gender equality is being promoted through these kinds of systems. And that's, you know, that, surely that is where the conversation should be and where the investment should be and not on high-level principles and the endless discussion of high-level principles, which has gone on in IGFs from year after year for like 20 years. Thank you, sorry. Yes. Hi, I'm Emma Gibson from the Alliance for Universal Digital Rights, or Audrey for short, and I definitely agree with the gentleman who's talking about independent audits, but unfortunately I also want to introduce another set of principles <laughs> that we launched this week. It's the um, Principles for a Feminist Global Digital Compact. Um, it's 10 principles, and one of them is around adopting equality by design principles and a human rights-based approach throughout all phases of digital technology development. And the Equal Rights Trust last week launched the, some equality by design principles themselves. And really, that's, that is including things like gender rights, impact assessments, um, incorporating them into the development um, of algorithmic decision-making systems or digital systems prior to deployment. So whatever you call them, um, there absolutely is appetite for that kind of thing. And they do need to be um, independent to make sure that we're not um, amplifying and perpetuating existing biases. Thank you. Okay. I think we should... Um, Come back to some of the sort of the, the the challenges that this technology might also be able to um, 
help with. So the, we were trying to get the session to focus on um, ways in which AI can solve some of these problems. And I wonder whether there are like particular challenges that we, that the, the, the panel or people in the room think that we should be spending our you know, time, effort, money on, um, uh, that we can actually sort of promote um, uh, gender um, uh, inclusivity and, and inequality. Like what, what should we be focusing on um, and how might AI help us, help us do that? Or, or other examples of things that are already um, sort of underway, very practically. Um, maybe I'll go first. Um, and here, I'm, I'm not going to talk about <laughs> the technical tools. Uh, I would go uh, more broadly, I think, around, uh, again, what kind of policy actions uh, can, can, can be put in place uh, to increase uh, gender equality in AI. Uh, one, uh, when we look at data uh, on AI, on women representation in AI, um, uh, the, the landscape is still uh, very much um, uh, not very positive for women. Uh, there are so we know that in OECD countries, uh, more than twice as many young men than women uh, can program, uh, which is essential for AI development. So there is already um, this uh, this uh, discrepancy. Then, in terms of AI researchers, uh, only um, one in four researchers publishing uh, in a, on, on AI worldwide is a woman. So uh, there is again uh, not fair representation in uh, in AI research. And when we look at uh, developers again, uh, this 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 share is. Uh, it's, it's even lower when, from a 2022 survey of Stack Overflow users, only 4% of respondents were female. And, and LinkedIn data um, suggests that female professionals with AI skills represent less than 2% of workers in most countries. So I, I would say that um, there are still policies, uh, basic policies that concern really development of uh, AI specific skills for women uh, that are essential. Uh, as we said at the beginning, uh, uh, I mean, one, one key aspect uh, is, is to increase women representation uh, in design of, of the systems, in research of the system. So this is a key uh, policy that, um, that countries should, should look at. Um, and, and there are countries obviously already doing that uh, by promoting, um, uh, by, by promoting uh, like scholarships um, or even programs at universities in Germany, for instance, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, providing funding to uh, women-led research teams in AI. So I, I would say there is a like some 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 policies that uh, countries can certainly do that it is really to to uh, address uh, one key gender gap, uh, which is the one of uh, representation of, of women uh, in AI research. So that's what um, yeah what, what I would suggest uh, to include gender. This is the, the, to to increase gender, uh, reduce gender gaps. Um, this is essential. Thank you very much. Uh, Emma, I, I think I want to come to you actually, um, if that's okay. Um, and because obviously you, you've shared us a little bit about how you're using AI for safe search and the sort of um, and ranking. I wonder whether you had any more like specific examples um, that you could that you could talk to and how like inclusion um, is being is being used um, in, in, in those products as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, one of the things I'm, I'm really excited about is how AI is improving our ability to do language understanding and to understand concepts at scale. One area that I've seen this have um, significant impact is a product I used to work on, Google Translate, where you know products like Google Translate, Google Search, um, we are actually all able to um, test them. We use them, um, many of us, every day. <laughs> And we find when they don't work well for us, uh, 
and we, we hear that from users. One thing that we heard in the past was during Women's um, World Cup, women would be typing in queries um, like France versus Brazil, and you'd find that it would take you to the men's football team. Typing in the England team, you see the men's team. That's something that we heard from users, we heard scrutinized and we looked to solve. Actually, it was a, a non-trivial problem to solve as we had to build the right partnerships. But this year, we were pleased to see that we were able to address that. The Women's World Cup, you could get easy and accessible results about women's football in just the same um, form factor that you could for men's. Um, that's a great example of how users held us accountable and we we're able to improve our systems. Um, in the same way for Google Translate, we've seen that there were some cases where translations were in the past not fully inclusive. Um, this can be because language is very complex around the way that we uh, think about gender in different languages. It's not always easy for a computer to translate that well. But as we have seen um, AI get better at pattern matching and our systems, our internal accountability, our internal ability to test these systems at scale, we have seen that um, Google Translate has got significantly better in this regard. And we've been able to test and validate that Translate is working across a wide range of languages in a way that we think is um, really effective for, um, for understanding gender in different ways. One um, specific example about a, a recent application of this is I can actually now talk to Translate and tell it in what form factor I want to be um, speaking. Do I want to be speaking in the formal version? Do I want to translate something so that it is in feminine tense or, or male tense? And this means we no longer need to default, right? We don't need to make assumptions around, were you talking about um, a male audience or a female audience? We can set that um, in the tool. And this is the kind of thing that's now possible um, and newly possible because of this technology. Um, I hopefully, hopefully uh, that made sense. But I, I think the thing I'm excited about here is we, we've been, you've all been holding us accountable for many years. Uh, that's one of the great things about working at Google is users hold us to a high, high standard. And I'm excited about AI as a tool that helps us meet that high standard better. Thank you. Yeah, it made a lot of sense. And it's just really good to hear, you know, these very practical but very large impact shifts um, that are, you know, are really starting to, you know, dig into um, the, the, the question here. And it's things that impact people on, on, on a day-to-day -day basis as well. Um, which I think is, you know, is, is really good. And Google's been particularly good at solving for day-to-day -day problems. It's built a, quite a large business out, out of it. Um, everyone here um, uh, who doesn't speak Japanese has probably used Google Translate or Lens or something um, to navigate the street signs or the, or the menus this week. Um, I, I definitely have. Any final questions or thoughts from the room? Yes, please. Yeah, come take the mic. Thank you. Hello. Um, yes, oh, my name is Natalia. I'm working in the field of education, and what Luci just mentioned really resonates with me. I work in Cambodia for the past eight years, and I'm the founder of the first female coding club. And the representation of uh, women in the field of technology is extremely low, is even low, lower than Lucia has mentioned. And if you type in Google search, Asian programmer, out of 20 images you will see, you will see maybe one or two female faces, Asian faces as programmers. But at the same time, like AI um, uh, adoption um, and uh, the growth is uh, giving me a lot of um, positive um, uh, vision, because I do believe that actually generative AI, especially generative AI tools, may bring a lot of opportunities for female uh, or workers uh, in the field. As we know, most of the girls would choose a social or humanitarian subject, and this is where generative AI uh, can be really a great field for the development uh, and application of these uh, interests uh, in, in, in human science and social science uh, mixed with technology. However, my question is, how can uh, the policymakers make sure that this component of the um, broader introduction and engagement of female uh, workers uh, and students uh, would be applied uh, across the world? 
I work in Cambodia where only 1.2% of girls choose to study technology. This is extremely low. And Khmer language, like in Google, they don't use, uh, it's, it's not that very well uh, uh, working yet. So there are many barriers and I really want to see much more focus on the upskilling, reskilling, and introduction of female voice uh, in the field of AI. And I think generative AI is a great pipeline for that. So are there any comments or uh, I would like to hear? Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Lucia, are there any sort of um, thoughts work from the OECD on this? You've, you've, you've touched on the, the same sort of deficit earlier. Um, yeah, I mean, it's um, uh, one, one point that actually uh, I, I forgot to make on the positive side is, is indeed that generative AI can help uh, because you, you have a coding co-pilots that actually can speed up uh, time to code and I think it can also be a tool for, for people to learn much quickly uh, to code, so there may be some, uh, as it was suggested, some um, some opportunities there uh, that are from generative AI. Um, the one uh, thing, of course, is that the, 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 the language uh, Mm, that is trained, the generative AI large language models are trained on, uh, n n the data uh, needs n need to be um, uh, need to be there. So what we see is also uh, a lot of investment uh, in um, in training uh, large language models in, uh, in in languages other than English. Uh, and so this is one thing that needs to be uh, also promoted uh, by countries so that this, these models exist uh, not only for the um, uh, for for the languages that have the most of the data. Um, and then uh, in terms of uh, of policies again uh, that is the um the question how do you bring uh, more interest from women uh, and i think one of the motivation that it was mentioned that it, that is key so um we have been in a lot of uh, of, of policies like coding uh, from earlier age uh, but also uh, as i said uh, scholarships but but also role models are, are quite important to um, to make uh, young girls uh, also uh, identify with uh, with with uh, <clears throat> type of of jobs that that they could uh, take on uh, later on so this is a, a big question how you have more women uh, in science but um, uh, but uh, as I said there are examples that that, that span uh, this kind of uh, um, uh, of policy actions um, um, yeah <laughs> thank you very much yeah and yeah definitely multi layered multi you no know, multi faceted challenge uh, to do that but I think the you know, the, the point here is that this becomes something that's in our sort of day-to-day -day apparatus and therefore people are going to be more interested um, in, in, in being part of it. So thank you, Natalia, for that, um, for that comment and, and question. Um, we're sort of coming to the end. I want to sort of, sort of wrap up in about 30 seconds or so, but I wanted to just see if any of our panelists had anything burning they wanted to share or respond to before I did that. No. Great. Well, um, huge thank you um, to our um, to our panelists for joining us in uh, a wide variety of time zones, um, and appreciate you staying up or getting up early to do so. Um, I definitely found it um, a very you know, interesting conversation. We were able to get into some of the practical aspects um, of this topic. Um, uh, we also touched on a, you know the the the, the, the multi layered and complex nature of this topic as well. Um, and I think that it's been um, really good to see that there's a lot of interest in um, developing solutions that can solve this problem with more people um, and, and a bit from a more inclusive um, way. Um, uh, we've had some principles launched in the session. We've had some discussions about the value of principles um, in the session. We've had some very practical um, data and sort of measures um, sort of shared. So I've, I've learned um, something and I thank you for, for, for doing that and, and for, for being part of this conversation. Um, and with that, I'd like to uh, close the session, say thank you again, um, and hope to see you all again soon. Thanks. <laughs>